I stopped doing it every time because there hasn't been any changes or stuff. I know that's Social something Security, I've seen so. when I've looked at files for our district, but we it does need to be done every year. Mm -hmm. okay. Every year. Now, it, there is, and, and I don't know if this is the case, it might not be, but there is the, when we talked about having to qualify for Pell Grants, where we said unless there's a, a significant financial change um, and you were that's you were denied that's, that's the Pell Grant narrative. That, that one I remember having a discussion when I was here, at least in the district, okay. about that. But as far as the financial form, make sure you're doing it every year with the annual review. And then, as often as their financial circumstances are changing, then, and then do it more often if needed. But at least once a year, you're, you're looking at that. It is required that we have a annual uh, reconsideration of financial need annually. But the Pell Grant one does say, right in the Pell Grant narrative, um, once we've got that initial denial, until their circumstances change or they reach age 24, they do not have to reapply. Okay, 448. You complete the 48 to determine if they're going to have a family contribution. Um, there's two sections on the 48. The first section is the one at the top that says, if their total client income, including spouse, family, everyone, is from exempted sources. What are our exempted sources? Workman's comp. Workers' comp. SSDI. SSI, SSDI, TANF, general assistance and other long-term disability programs. If all of the money coming into the house fits in that top section, we can check that box. If they're getting workers' comp in the top, but a spouse is getting um, income down at the bottom part, we're gonna go ahead and run it through the financial needs test just using that bio income. Can you take the one over SSI? is different, that's the second piece of that. Or, the client uh, is allowed SSI, SSDI. If the client gets SSI, SSDI for their disability, you check the box, you sign the form, and you're done with it. Um, you have to make sure it's for their disability. I have had some situations where I'll get a batch update that says the client's getting SSI, and in reality they're getting it for a dependent child, for a disabled child. So it's not for their disability, but there is income coming in. So do we then count? Yeah, we don't count. No, we don't count. We never count Social Security income. We never count any income up at the top. It's only those in the, the second section. Do we count survivor benefits? Yes. Survivor benefits, um, disability benefits, somebody is leaving, or children's benefits for a disabled parent. Um, so again, in the, what we're exempting is the disability income from Social Security, relating directly to the client disability. Uh, children's benefit of a disabled parent. So the parent's disabled and they get a social security benefit. Their benefit counts as income. No, because you don't have a place to put kids' income. Mm -hmm. No, because the client's getting that for their disability. But if my client comes in and says, yeah, I'm getting 300 a month from social security because my dad's on disability, I would consult on that one. Because I've heard district directors go both ways on that particular one. Um, in the truest sense here, it goes down in the bottom under other in income and we count it. But it's usually just a couple hundred a month. And I've only had that situation come up once. So, um, If they're not exempted, if the income's not from exempted sources, or part exempt, part non exempt, you're gonna complete section two, which is filling out the, the entire form here. Use your professional skills and judgment to determine appropriate use of client contributions toward their services. <coughs> so it's your judgment with this. Um, and you're gonna document how they're going to contribute in that comment section. If the client's in status 10, you put something like, to be determined once the IP is developed. Because I don't know how they're going to do it yet. We don't know what services they're going to do. Um, if they're in a plan, put in, you know, will use for their transportation to school, or will use for their transportation to doctor's appointments, or they will do this or whatever with it. Um, so that we're getting something in that comment section saying, yes, we know this client is going to be contributing, and we're going to check the IPE to see how we're going to do that. Okay? What if they have a large amount of money in like a savings account, like 10 grand or something? I mean, that's, would we document what that money's going to be used for? 
Well, it's going to show up as like so much per month. Right. Um, oh, yeah, so it's the right of way flow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it would be that, you know, this will be considered once we start purchasing this, that, or the other. I had a client who had, um, his financial contribution was $853 a month. And so he came in and he wanted help going to school. Because of his financial contribution, he was paying the first $3,400 a semester of any school related, of any VR related services. So we weren't paying for anything because his was so high. So high. Um, and so, and it was because his spouse had a really great job and it was just the two of them. And, and so we were focused in on the. Um, Unpaid services with them. So. You know, it's weird. When all my clients, pretty much that I've seen, when they come in and they fill out the form, it's always like, oh, well, it's zero, 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 like all the way down. Mm -hmm. It's like, so you have no money coming in. No, no. Mm -hmm. And since we can't check, it's mm -hmm. just like. I'm taking their word for it. Well, it is worth a conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and this is. You have no money coming in. How are you supporting your family? Because I think that's very important to their rehabilitation process. It's not that I want them to bring in their IRS, you know, their tax documents to see what they're doing. I really need to know, especially if I'm thinking of supporting this person through a training program. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking at support. Well, you're asking for a training program, but you don't have any way to support yourself and your children. So. How, how is this going to work? It's a fair conversation mm -hmm. to have. It's not off limits, but we don't want to get to the point where we're saying, well, I don't believe you. I want to see your doctor. But you can have those conversations. And I do. And yeah. most of the time they're just like, oh, well, I have food stamps. Or I have food stamps. I don't have plasma to pay for my jams and my cigarettes. Um, I'm living for free with a friend or I'm living yeah. in my parents' basement. It's like that. And all that stuff gets documented yeah. right into your R11 mm -hmm. so that if somebody ever came to look at the file, we would know exactly. that that conversation had happened. So how are you supporting your family of five on $800 a month? Well, we live for free in my in-laws' rental. Great and comparable benefits. Benefit. And this is something that when the auditor goes through the files, he's been really concerned about... Just well, is so someone says I come in and I need help with rent, and, and you just turn around and pay for it. Well, no. If that were the case, I would look at you know A, B, C, and D. So those are the conversations he's looking at, looking for in our R elevens. Is did we secure comparable benefits? Because I know we're doing it, and I know that they're mm -hmm. that that you're having these conversations, or at least the, I know most of you are. That then you're narrating it so that nobody's guessing or thinking that we're not doing it when give reality it's happening. Give yourself credit in your narratives for everything you're doing. Because they are looking extremely close. Um, and, and there's a whole philosophical debate that's going to rear its ugly head. And it'll be fun to watch the state and the feds battle it out. Because the feds say, we cannot put caps. We cannot determine a service based on the cost. So if I really believe my client needs this $85,000 van to be independently and so they can go to work, the Fed say then pay for it. The state says, 85 for one person? Maybe we could split that up and you could give... Did you try making them ride the bus first? Yeah. Well, how come they can't last week? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was the conversation I had with the auditor, and it wasn't even based on the file that was here in our office. Mm -hmm. But um, so if somebody needed, uh, say, a van conversion, what are the steps? Or someone says, I need to get to work, do you immediately go out and buy them a car? Well, of course not. I mean, then everybody, all our clients would come in here and get cars. That's not what happens. We, we first, you know, try and use. Um, Comparable benefits. Comparable benefits. We seek out UTA, but then we're also <laughs> documenting UTA does not work for this, 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 and this reason. This is why we're having to take it to the next step. Yeah, the um, the eighty five dollar eighty five thousand dollar van conversion triggered a whole bunch of conversations. And I'm not saying that it's not appropriate for that client, but it come keep in mind we're coming from a legislature that's going. Okay, if I give you $100,000 and you spend it on one person, or would you be better off spending it on 20 people at 5000 each? Because they don't look at numbers. And we're going to spread the wealth amongst everyone instead of just giving this one person something that it's really nice for them, but, you know, we'll sacrifice the ones who served without a 19 type of thing. So, 
Just document. Just document. The one thing with the 48, 